know about Taylor Swift's Midnight's Era. The album was surprise announced at the 2022 VMAs and was released October 21st, 2022. There were no lead singles leading up to the release of this album, and all singles, Antihero, Lavender, Haze, and Karma were released after the album was put out. However, she did slowly reveal the tracklist of the album via her Midnight's Mayhem with me via TikTok. Taylor Swift described the album as representing 13 sleepless nights in her past that represented five major themes, self-hatred, revenge fantasies, wondering what might have been, falling in love, and falling apart. She revealed these themes via Spotify. This was the first autobiographical album released during the re-recording era after Fearless and Red TV, as well as the first autobiographical album released after her Folklore Evermore era. During the release of this album, she was with her former partner Joe Alwyn, but the album touches on many past relationships speculated to be about Harry Styles, John Mayer. Here's five things to know about Taylor Swift's Lavender Haze. This was the second official single from the Midnight's era, and it was written with Jack Antonoff, Zoe Kravitz, Soundwave, Johan Sweet, Sam Dew, and produced with Jack Antonoff, Soundwave, and Johan Sweet. She said when writing this song, she was inspired by a Mad Men quote about the Lavender Have, which when she researched it, supposedly described a state of being in love. At the release of the album, she was with her current long-term partner, Joe Alwyn, and this song specifically addresses the media scrutiny around her long-term relationship. She said via Instagram, like my relationship, for six years we've had to dodge weird rumors, tabloid stuff, and we just ignore it about the song. They run it back to the 1950s Mad Men inspiration for the song. In the chorus, she says the 1950s shit they want from me, and she specifically addresses the rumor about them being married at the time with the lyrics, all they keep asking me is if I'm gonna be your bride. The music video for this song does feature a few Easter eggs, particularly for the following re-recording Speak Now TV. five things to know about Taylor Swift's Maroon. This song was written and produced with Jack Antonoff. Many people have compared this song to her track Red from the Red album, whereas Red is a burning red, bright, and very passionate, Maroon is a darker, more somber, complex color. There has been many speculation as to who this song could be about. Obviously, the Red inspiration could be about Jake Gyllenhaal, could be about her current partner at the time, Joe Alwyn, as well as many have speculated that it could be about her former fling, Tom Hiddleston, all focusing around the New York imagery being heavily associated with them. The entire song is focusing on the breakdown of a past relationship with lyrics such as the rust that grew between telephones, the lips I used to call home, and the opening of the chorus changes from and I chose you to and I lost you via the second chorus. The last track, Daylight, on her previous autobiographical album, Lover, ends with the lyrics, I once believed love would be burning red, but it's golden like daylight. However, she has changed and flipped to a dark red version of love. Here's five things to know about Taylor Swift's Antihero. This song was written and produced with Jack Antonoff and acted as the lead single for Midnight's. In an Instagram reel, Taylor Swift specifically said that this song talks about her struggling a lot with the idea that her life has become unmanageably sized. Just like the Archer on Lover, this song deals with her personal insecurities and lyrics such as I have this thing where I get older but just never wiser, Midnight's become my afternoons. And did you hear my covert narcissism? I disguise this altruism like some kind of congressman. And of course, the chorus sums up the entire idea about being an anti-hero with it's me, hi, I'm the problem, it's me, at tea time, everybody agrees. The lyrics, I feel like everybody is a sexy baby, is a reference to a 30 Rock episode where Tina Fey refers to someone who's over-sexualizing herself as a sexy baby. This song did receive a few remixes, particularly with the bleachers, so if you hear people screaming Taylor, you'll be fine during this song, that's where that comes. Here's five things to know about Taylor Swift's Snow on the Beach, featuring Lana Del Rey. This song was written with Jack Antonoff and Lana Del Rey and was produced with Jack Antonoff. Taylor Swift has described this song as focusing on this sort of cosmic faded moment where you realize someone feels exactly the same way that you feel. Obviously, she's using the metaphor of snow on the beach to this very rare moment. You can see this in the lyrics, and time can't stop me quite like you did. And it's like snow at the beach, weird but effing beautiful, flying in a dream. And this scene feels like what I once saw on a screen. I searched for a real screen. My smile was like I won a contest. In the bridge, she says, Now I'm all for you like Janet, which is a reference to the Janet Jackson song, All for You, where she's talking about being committed and devoted to her partner. Due to criticism of Taylor Swift once again relegating female artists and collaborators to the background vocals, tracks this did receive an extended cut with Lana Del Rey being featured more on an extended version of this. Here's five things to know about Taylor Swift's You're On Your Own Kid. This song was written and produced with Jack Antonoff. Many believe this song is a reflection on her life and career. Starting in verse one she says I wait patiently he's gonna notice me. This could be a reference to the debut era with teardrops on my guitar. 
Also, I didn't choose this town. I dream of getting out. Could be talking about her move from Pennsylvania to Tennessee. In verse 2, she says, I see the great escape so long Daisy May. Daisy May is a reference to a nice and obedient girl, which could be a reference to her early country days. She also says, something different bloomed writing in my room. I play songs in the parking lot, which could also be a reference to her early songwriting days. We see a reference to her past ED and 1989 era with I hosted parties and starved my bodies in the brain. And we can see a reference to reputation with the jokes weren't funny. I took the money. My friends from home don't know what to say. I looked around in a blood soaked gown and saw something they can't take away. Could be a reference to the Stephen King book, Carrie. And the reason we're making friendship bracelets for the heiress tour, we have the line, so make the friendship bracelets take the moment. And Here's five things to know about Taylor Swift's Midnight Rain. This song was written and produced with Jack Antonoff. Midnight Rain focuses on a past relationship of hers where she is metaphorically the midnight rain or the darkness and her partner is metaphorically the sunshine. Essentially, they were both going in different paths at the time. While many people have speculated who this song could be about, she does make a reference to Speak Now in the outro with the lyrics, I guess sometimes we all get some kind of haunted, haunted being a track on Speak Now. On the reference to Speak Now, this song could be about her past relationship with Taylor Lautner with the lyrics, My boy was a montage, a slow motion love potion, jumping off things in the ocean, which could be a reference to him in Twilight. She once again talks about marriage expectations in this song like she did in Lavender Haze and You're Losing Me with the lyrics, He wanted it comfortable, I wanted that pain. He wanted a bride, I was making my own name. Chasing that fame, he stayed the same. Her talking about how she ended up choosing her career over this relationship, which she also talks about in the song 15. Here's five things to know about Taylor Swift's question. This song was written and produced with Jack Antonoff. Many believe this song to be about her past relationship with Harry Styles as it features an interpolation of the song Out of the Woods from 1989, an album that is very famously speculated to be about Harry Styles. She opens the song with the lyrics, Good girl, sad boy, big city, wrong choices. Obviously, 1989 heavily focuses on New York with songs like Welcome to New York, and she talks about her references to being that good girl in the song's style. And of course, she has the lyrics, Did you leave her house in the middle of the night? Oh, did you wish she put up more of a fight? In 1989, she explores a very quick fire relationship and how she wishes that her former partner would have fought, or like in the song, all he had to do was stay, all he had to do was stay. The cheering in the background is comprised of Jack Antonoff's sister Rachel, Austin Swift, and Dylan O'Brien. Here's five things to know about Taylor Swift's vigilante shit. This song was solely written by Taylor Swift and produced with Jack Antonoff. This song explores the topic of revenge, which Taylor Swift said was one of the five inspirations for the Midnight's album. She specifically states this in the lyrics, I don't dress for women, I don't dress for men, lately I've been dressing for revenge. She's also likely talking about the over-sexualization of her body as she's saying she doesn't dress for anyone but herself. In verse 2, she says, picture me thick as thieves with your ex-wife and she looks so pretty driving in your bend, lately she's been dressing for revenge. This could be referring to the ex-wife of Scooter Braun, or it could also be referring to Kim K as she was seen driving Kanye's bins. And in verse 3, she says, while he was doing lines and crossing all of mine, someone told his white-collar crimes to the FBI. And in 2021, Scooter Braun, who did buy Taylor Swift's Masters, was sued by a Goldman Sachs executive for fraud and breach of contract. Here's five things to know about Taylor Swift's Be Jold. The song was written and produced with Jack Antonoff. This song does have some double meaning. The whole song is talking about how her current partner does not value her and how she's going out and reclaiming that value. She's also stated that this song is describing her re-entering the pop world after her alternative era of folklore and evermore. Many have speculated who this song could be about. Many do believe that it's about her ex, Calvin Harris, but it also could be about her relationship at the time, Joe Alwyn. On the topic of her reclaiming her pop status, she has lyrics, didn't notice you walking over my peace of mind in the shoes I gave you as a present. This could be a reference to Scott Borchetta, who sold her masters. She also talks about the re-recording process and reclaiming her masters with the lyrics, I made you my world, have you heard? I can reclaim the land. The land being her masters. The music video did feature cameos from famous makeup artists, Pat McGrath, her collaborator, Jack Antonoff, and Dita Von Teese. Also, the music video contained Easter eggs for the following recordings for 1989 TV. Here's five things to know about Taylor Swift's Labyrinth. This song was written and produced with Jack Antonoff. The whole song is talking about Taylor Swift falling in love with someone after experiencing a lot of love loss, trauma, and just bad past experiences. The chorus demonstrates this with the lyrics, Uh-oh, I'm falling in love again. Oh no, I'm falling in love again. Oh, I'm falling in love. I thought the plane was going down. How'd you turn it right around? She did tease the lyrics, breathe in, breathe through, breathe deep, breathe out in her NYU commencement speech. She references the title and the lyrics, it only feels this raw right now, lost in the labyrinth of my mind. She has explored her mental health on other tracks such as The Archer on Lover or Antihero on this album. And this is talking about how she constantly gets hung up on her past and gets lost in her own thoughts. 
In the pre-core, she says, you know how much I hate that everyone just expects me to bounce back just like that. And she somewhat explores this topic more on the song Sweet Night. Here's five things to know about Taylor Swift's Karma. This song was written with Jack Antonoff, Soundwave, Johan Sweet, and Keanu Beats, and was produced with Jack Antonoff, Soundwave, and Keanu Beats. This song did receive a remix with Ice Spice on one of the Midnight Selects editions. Miss Swifties have been speculating for years that Karma was the lost album that was supposed to be released between 1989 and Reputation before everything went down in the 1989 era with Kanye West and so forth. In this song, she's confronting all the people who have wronged her in her life and talking about how Karma works in her favor. In verse 2, she said, Spider Boy, King of Thieves. This could refer to Scooter Braun, who bought her masters. And then it says, My pennies made your crown. Don't you know that cash ain't the only price? This is likely referring to Scott Forchetta, who sold her masters. Then a bridge, she says, Ask me what I learned from all those years. Ask me what I earned from all those tears. Ask me why so many fade, but I'm still here. Talking about how even though she's gone through all of these problems and trauma in her life, she still continued to make music and rise in fame. And we hear everyone yelling facts during the Eras tour. It's five things to know about Taylor Swift's Sweet Nothing. This song was written with William Bowery, aka Joe Alwyn, and produced with Jack Antonoff. This song is all about exploring the simplicity of life and the little things that you experience in your relationship. One of these little things she refers to in verse 1, I spy with my little Tyler's eye, tiny as a firefly, a pebble that we picked up last July, does it ever miss Wicklow sometimes, referring to probably a big vacation with such a tiny little thing. She refers to the media attention and speculation around her life in many songs of this album, such as Lavender Haze. In the chorus, she says, Outside, they're pushing and shoving. You're in the kitchen humming. All that you ever wanted from me was sweet nothing. Talking about how her partner only wants her and nothing else. She talks about the media attention again in the bridge with, And the voices that implore you should be doing more. To you, I can admit that I'm just too soft for all of it. This song is very much like a lyrical poem, and she makes reference to her poetry and writing in the lyrics. On the way home, I wrote a poem. You say, what a mind. This happens all the Here's time. Here's five things to know about Taylor Swift's Mastermind. This song was written and produced with Jack Antonoff. The whole song talks about how every move in her relationship and her current career, she has been the mastermind behind and she was always thinking three steps ahead. For example, in the chorus, she says, what if I told you none of it was accidental and the first night that you saw me, nothing was gonna stop me. She has referred to love being game in many songs such as Blank Space and State of Grace, but in this one we see her saying, You see all the wisest women had to do it this way because we were born to be the pawn at every lover's game, talking about all the moves and calculated positioning she had to take to fall in love. She says on the bridge, No one wanted to play with me as a little kid, so I've been scheming like a criminal ever since to make them love me and make it seem effortless, talking about how she's kind of been on this people-pleasing path to always make people think she does it so easy when she doesn't. She also says, I'm only cryptic and Machiavellian because I care. Machiavellian refers to Machiavelli, and it means to be cunning and scheming. And in the outro, she says, You knew the entire time you knew that I'm a mastermind, saying this is nothing new. Here's five things to know about Taylor Swift's The Great War. This song was written and produced with Aaron Desner. In the song, she's referring to a conflict within her relationship to the Great War or a Great War. You see her referring to soldiers and battle once again in You're Losing Me. For example, in verse 1, she says, My knuckles were bruised like violets, sucker punching walls, cursed you as I sleep, talk. Maybe it was her flashes of the battle coming back in a blur. This could refer to her insecurity within the relationship sparking a battle. And she talks in the chorus how they made it through the Great War. She said, I vow not to cry anymore if we survive the Great War. So if we can survive this big conflict, then we can survive anything together. She talks about how her past is influencing this current conflict with, and maybe it's the past that's talking, screaming from the crypt, tell me to punish you for things you never did. We see the crypt and tomb imagery once again explored and would have, could have, should have. She once again explores the severity of the situation in the bridge where she says, that was the night I nearly lost you. I really thought I'd lost you talking about how she doesn't want to go through this ever Here's again. five things to know about Taylor Swift's Bigger Than The Whole Sky. This song was written by Taylor Swift and produced with Jack Antonoff. This song explores a loss of someone or something that was just too soon or their time was cut too short. She does make reference to her other song on the album, Would Have, Could Have, Should Have, with the lyrics in the chorus, I'm never gonna meet what could have been, would have been, what should have been, you. She explores a really deep sadness with the lyrics, every single thing I touch becomes sick with sadness cause it's all over now, all out to sea. All out to see could be reference to a burial. In verse 2, she says, Did some bird flap its wings over in Asia? Did some force take you because I didn't pray? The bird flap could talk about the butterfly effect, about how one small action that she could have performed led to this big loss, even though, you know, that probably didn't happen. This song is very heavy and discusses a lot about loss and grief, so do be conscious when you start speculating what the song could be about. Here's five things about Taylor Swift's song, Paris. This song was written and produced with Jack Antonoff. The song was featured on the 3AM edition of My Nights, but it was not featured on the Late Night edition. 
This song is relating a love or relationship like being alone in Paris without prying eyes. The chorus literally says, like we were in Paris, like we were somewhere else. Verse 1 opens up with your ex-friend's sister met someone at a club and kissed her going down to, did you see the photo? No, I didn't, but thanks though. Talking about how she's not paying attention to what's going on in the outside world because she doesn't care anymore. In the pre-course, she says, cheap wine, make believe it's champagne. I was taken by the view. Talking about even the cheapest or the smallest of things can feel like a luxury when she's alone with this person. She's talking about the secrecy of her relationship in lyrics, privacy sign on the door, and on my page on the whole world, romance is not dead if you keep it just yours. This could be referring to the relationship with Joe Alwyn, which was kept secret and from the public for most Here's of Here's five things to know about Taylor Swift's high infidelity. This song was written and produced with Aaron Desner. This song is exploring this is song is exploring her cheating or possibly cheating on a past partner. She opens with verse one saying lock broken, slur spoken, wound open, game token, I didn't know you were keeping count, talking about how her current partner at the time was always keeping score in their relationship. Many believe this song is about her ex Calvin Harris with lyrics such as High Infidelity put on your records and regret me. He is a famous DJ, the records could refer to that. And High Fidelity is a reference to the highest quality of sound and High Infidelity is a reference to infidelity and cheating. And in the refrain she says, do you really want to know where I was April 29th? Do I really have to chart the constellation in his eyes? The theory around April 29th is this is the day then 2016 where her ex Calvin Harris released a song that she wrote on, This Is What We Came For. And also the day where she met her later boyfriend, Joe Here's Alwyn. five things to know about Taylor Swift's Glitch. This song was written with Jack Antonoff, Mark Spears, and Sam Dew, and was produced with Jack Antonoff and Soundwave. This song explores a casual relationship that turned into much more that she didn't expect. And the backdrop for Glitch on Spotify shows the Wildest Dreams announcement TikTok, which had a famous glitch in it. She opens the verse with saying, we were supposed to be just friends, and then in the chorus she says, I think there's been a glitch. Five seconds later, I'm fastening myself to you with a stitch, saying we were supposed to just be friends, and you know, things happened. Many believe this song to be about her ex Joe Alwyn, specifically in verse 2 she says, but it's been 2,196 days of our love blackout, which refers to the six-year relationship that they were in. She also says in verse 2, in search of glorious happenings of happenstance on someone else's playground. In a previous song on the 3AM edition, she refers to the possibility of her cheating or being with another person while seeking out a relationship. Here's five things to know about Taylor Swift's would've, could've, should've. This song was written and produced with Aaron Desner. Many believe this to be a reflection on her relationship with John Mayer, who dated her when she was 19 and he was 32. In Dear John, she says, don't you think 19 is too young? And in the chorus of this song, she says, and I damn sure never would have danced with the devil at 19. She makes reference to a lot of religious imagery in here, specifically in verse 2, she says, if you never touched me, I would have gone along with the righteous. And she specifically talks about the publicity around the relationship where she says, if I never blushed and they could have never whispered about this. And she makes reference to the common phrase, promising young man with the lyrics, and if I was some paint, did it splatter on a promising grown man. In the bridge of this, she says, God rest my soul, I miss who I used to be, the tomb won't close. She makes reference to a tomb in the Great War as well. She also says in verse 3, living for the thrill of hitting you where it hurts, giving back my girlhood, it was mine first. Obviously talking about how this older man took away some of her youth and her girlhood, sort of forcing her into adulthood. Here's five things to know about Taylor Swift's Dear Reader. This song was written and produced with Jack Antonoff. The whole song is her giving the listener or reader some advice, but the whole chorus is talking about don't take advice from someone who is falling apart. She specifically says, never take advice from someone who's falling apart. And the outro, she says, you should find another guiding light, but I shine so bright. She makes reference to Legally's Blonde's Bend and Snap with the verse 2 saying, Dear Reader, bend when you can, snap when you have to. She also says in verse 2, Dear Reader, the greatest of luxuries is your secrets. She became very secretive post the 1989-2016 era, specifically with her relationship with Joe Alwyn. In the bridge she says, I prefer hiding in plain sight, my fourth drink in my hand, these desperate prayers of a cursed man. And then she says, where I pace in my pen and my friends found friends who care, no one sees when you lose when you're playing solitaire. This could be a reference to her living alone or being there without her current partner, which was Joe Alwyn at the time. Here's five things to know about Taylor Swift's It's Different. The song was written and produced with Jack Antonoff and Aaron Desner, and it originally featured on the Lavender version exclusive to Target, but was released on the Till Dawn edition on streaming. This song is exploring the aftermath of a breakup. Specifically, she's out drinking with friends and she opens with verse one saying, I washed my hands of us at the club, you made a mess of me. She also says, each bar plays our song, nothing has ever felt so wrong. She obviously wrote a lot of songs about her exes, probably Joe Alwyn in this case, and they are played across the radio. 
She says in the course, catastrophic blues moving on was always easy for me to do. It hits different, it hits different because it's you. Obviously this was a very long relationship that she thought was going to last forever. And blue was a common color that she referred to Joe in in many songs. She says in verse three, I heard your key turn in the door down the hallway. This could be a reference to you're losing me as well. She also says, I trace the evidence, make it make some sense. And in the blur for the tortured poet's apartment, she says, Here's five things to know about You're Losing Me by Taylor Swift. This song was released as a vault track for Midnight on the Late Night Edition, and it was produced and written with Jack Antonoff. Just like in Wildest Dreams, you can hear Taylor Swift's heartbeat or a heartbeat in the background of this track. And in the last line of the song, My Heart Won't Start Anymore, you know, I Won't Find a Pulse Anymore, which she keeps repeating throughout this, you actually hear the heartbeat stop. The entire metaphor for this song is the death of a relationship, so she has lines talking about how she is sick or their relationship is sick, and how can you say that you love someone you can't tell is dying, or my face is gray but you wouldn't admit that we were sick. She alludes to many midnight songs in this track, but particularly the Great War with lines such as, fighting an only your army, front lines don't you ignore me, and all I did was bleed as I tried to be the bravest soldier. Lastly, since many people believe this song to be about her long-term relationship with Joe Alwyn, the song How Long Could We Be a Sad Song could be an allusion to how many sad songs they co-wrote together.